Right. So, um, yeah, so it's just, I, I mentioned this already, uh, but in some cases, uh, Baxter Scar have reason to, to, to suspect there's a pre-initial, but they can't tell what its place of articulation is, so they write it with a capital C. Okay. So we start with pre-initial S. Basically, all researchers who think there are consonant clusters at all uh, think there is a pre-initial S, but there is kind of quite, um, I mean, I would even say vicious disagreement about in which circumstances you should reconstruct uh, this type pre-initial S. And Zev Handel has a nice article that kind of, where he's trying to kind of make the camps uh, kiss and make up. Um, so, so, so I think that's a good place to go for that. But, you know, I'm going to stick with Baxter and Cigar's presentation. So, uh, type pre-initial as one of the origins of Middle Chinese, type pre-initial S as one of the origins of Middle Chinese S. So here's a Sheisheng series where you see contact between uh, M initial words and an S initial word, yeah? So uh, here you, and in other places, you will see that I give a, a pre-chin form of the script uh, and I'm, I'm not doing that in any kind of rigorously paleographic way. It's just uh, to help you see that the analysis of these characters as belonging to the same Sheishun series is plausible. So if you look at the fourth character on the slide, it's not really obvious that it belongs in this Sheishun series. Uh, but if you look at its uh, pre-chin form, it, it seems pretty plausible, right? So in this series, we have, you know, uh, let's say two, two words that start with M, one that starts with, a, um, with an X, which actually, it's probably some kind of font problem in my presentation. There should be a little circle under that M, because as we saw yesterday, um, one of the sources of velar uh, fricatives is voiceless labial uh, resonance. So, you know, in, if you look at those first three, you're like, oh, okay, we, we did that yesterday. But now today we add in, look, what is an S initial word doing in this series? Well, Baxter and Cigar say, uh, actually, it also was an M initial, but it had an S pre-initial. So that's their solution to that. And, uh, uh, and yeah, and then I just am trying to go through kind of systematically in type A syllables. So here we have an SM reconstructed in a type A syllable. And here we have SM uh, reconstructed in a type B syllable. Okay, so now, um, yeah, I don't want to go through this too fast, but it, it's kind of much of a muchness is what they would say uh, here in the UK. Um, so SN develops into S in type A syllables. And here's the evidence. We have a Sheishung series that's mostly N initial, but it has an S initial word in it. And in type B syllables. So again, mostly N initial, but one S initial word. Uh, and now with ng. So we have uh, in type A uh, here uh, a mostly ng initial series, but with some words that start with S. Uh, and in type B, again, a mostly ng initial series, uh, but with one word that uh, begins with S in Middle Chinese. Okay, now uh, with the lateral, so I mean, uh, and, and this is actually a nice series in terms of showing you just how messy uh, a, middle, uh, a middle Chinese, you know, in middle Chinese garb, a Sheisheng series can look, uh, but you, you, we have this um, contact between ya and da and ta. So we saw yesterday, we reconstruct that as a lateral series. Um, and uh, then uh, we, um, we have some S initial words, one type A, one type B, which is convenient because then we can just use the one series to prove both sound changes. Uh, so we reconstruct SL uh, as one of the sources of S. And, uh, you know, uh, same style of argument. Here we have a uvular series uh, that suddenly has an, uh, it's actually a labio uvular series, uh, where we have a, a character with an S initial. So, um, so why not reconstruct uh, a type pre-initial S? 
Uh, I will state it slightly differently, which okay. is uh, when a person has a syllable-based orthography and they want to write a word that they don't know how to write, <laughs> they turn to a similarly pronounced word and and then oh, yeah. press yeah. it into service right so uh i'm actually this is i haven't written it yet but this is what i'm uh, planning to talk about in my evening lecture next week so a very simple um uh you know example let's say let's say we speak modern english and we've just invented writing and so we have we draw a picture of a deer to mean the animal deer uh, and then we find ourselves wanting to write a letter back home to our mother and we want to start it with dear mother but we have no no writing system so we don't know how to write the word dear so we draw a picture of the word dear and and now that works well because it dear and dear have segmentally identical pronunciations at least in my dialect yeah okay uh, and then, um, and then later, um, you know, in the letter, I find myself wanting to say I uh, bought a, a new steering wheel for my car, and I think, gosh, how am I going to write the word steer? And then I think, well, it's awfully similar to deer, but it's not the same. So maybe I'll like write a, a, a picture of a deer with a little car next to it, and then my mom will. Uh, will be able to, to say to herself, okay, what word sounds like deer, but has to do with cars? And then she'll say, oh, it, he probably means steer here. Yeah. So that is the, that is called the rebus principle, uh, which is basically, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know, let's stick with bolts here. He thinks basically whenever you invent a script, you know, ex nihilo, you, uh, you use the, you, you start with very iconic you know, things, and then you move to more abstract things through uh, pronunciation using the rebus principle. So we imagine that that's what we're looking at when we see a Sheshang series, is like, this is a, a series of morphemes that, um, that, could, that, that could be related to each other via the rebus principle, which means that their pronunciation has to have been pretty similar, yeah? And then the question is, which which is partly uh, just uh, how can I say, a question of your a priori assumptions, is how similar can something right. does does something have to be, to be uh, permissible uh, to use this rebus principle in the let's say in Li Fang Kui's version of the Sheshan uh, hypothesis, you say uh, syllables must rhyme, and have homoorganic initials in order to qualify for this kind of rebus relationship. And, um, and then I would say that uh, you can really um, set up uh, different Chinese historical phonologists on some kind of spectrum uh, in terms of how doctrinaire they are about this principle, where Baxter and Cigar are very doctrinaire. Like they really, think, you know, it, you cannot leave that S alone. You cannot say that, you know, people were like, oh, yeah, you know, gun, sun, whatever. Yeah. Uh, um, whereas other uh, schools feel like, uh, you know, come on, like uh, you, 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 the each act of inventing a new character happened in a specific time and place uh, by a specific person. And there's no way we can get in their heads and know exactly what they were thinking. And similarly, we can be pretty sure that they didn't hold some giant committee meeting where they all agreed, like, we will only invent new characters that have homo organic initials and rhyme. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so those people feel like you, you shouldn't push the Sheshang hypothesis too strongly. And this is, I mean, kind of maybe you'll get used to this. Uh, uh, but I feel like, you know, the truth doesn't matter. What matters is what's good methodology. And clearly good methodology is to be as doctrinaire as possible, right? And then, and then let yourself propose ridiculous things for ideological reasons. 
And that is how you will discover why they are ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, so that's, you know, my feeling uh, on, on, on this. And I think that actually in the preface to his, his dictionary, Schussler does this, Schussler is, thinks Baxter's go, go way, way too far. Uh, and so he tries to tell little stories about like why in this and this situation, there was a counter prevailing consideration where basically, you know, someone found himself in, in, in a tricky situation. And so he found a pragmatic solution in terms of how to write something uh, that, that overrid the Shesham uh, hypothesis. And I think that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, how, how that, that's right, you know, which is to say, uh, that's exactly the conversation we need. It's valid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we yeah. need a conversation between the 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 ultra ideological Sheshang adherents and and their critics who can come up with very good stories about mm -hmm. why uh, being so ideological doesn't work in particular cases. Another labor uvular now in type B uh, a series that has an S initial so. Uh, let's reconstruct another S cluster. But in this case, uh, I'll just say it's not clear to me how Baxter and Cigar decide whether or not um, uh, this uh, particular word uh, is aspirated. Um, and I will also point out that there are no type B syllables that Baxter and Cigar reconstruct with an S a pre prefix to uvulars, but without uh, labio labialization. So we don't get any, you know, as, as far as I can tell in the 2014 book, we don't get any SQs without a W or a medial R. And I just think that's a, I don't know, it's the pattern I noticed. Maybe it's totally meaningless, uh, but uh, that's, I think that's the sort of, we need to be uh, on our toes for these sort of um, phonotactic holes and, and wonder whether maybe that they point to uh, you know, maybe problems in their analysis. Okay, so now uh, uh, here's a series where we actually have uh, an S connected to, uh, uh, to a, a velar, uh, but, uh, and actually this is, this is, this is one where um, morphological speculation comes in. They think script notches and wedge are etymologically related. Uh, and I think that's actually how they present it in their book. But I, I just sort of point out to you that this is also a Sheshang relationship. So you can, you can, you can posit at least some kind of, um, of uh, 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 S cluster in the word wedge uh, purely based on the Sheshang relationship. Uh, but the mismatch of the uvular with the velar is a problem. Uh, uh, and you, you, you could, of course, you know, reconstruct the, 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 the velar as a uvular, um, but the series overall does not have any other words uh, that are incompatible with a velar initial reconstruction. Okay, so uh, now, you know, I'm moving on again, another example where we have a uvular series, uh, but with, a, um, with an S word in it. Uh, and in this case, I would say it's not again. It's not clear to me why they choose aspiration rather than um, without aspiration, or why they don't uh, reconstruct this series with uh, with velar nasals because you can have a velar nasal origin of both the velar fricative uh, and the um, and of course the velar nasal, right? So. Um, and, and maybe this is just a, a case of showing you that, that there's a lot of flexibility in their system, right? If, if you just look at these three uh, examples, you could reconstruct it as they have, uh, S, SQH, MQH, uh, and, uh, and QH, or you could reconstruct it SNG, uh, NG, and, um, and, uh, and, you know, NG, sort of uh, voiceless NG. And I think somehow that's just, you know, my, I don't know, this is, Kind of maybe just a question of taste. I think that would, would have been a slightly simpler analysis uh, because it would have left uh, the 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 ve the, ne the second character the velar nasal. It would have just left it alone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but um, but in case they do what they do, 
And uh, just to point out that uh, they think there's actually a dialect split where uh, SQH uh, develops in, into T in a different dialect. And actually, I, I think one of the most uh, interesting and, and kind of productive areas of their book is uh, pointing to uh, hypotheses of dialect variation that can then be more systematically explored. Okay, so now, um, you know, STS cluster, uh, well, here's, uh, this one's a little, uh, well, yeah, this one's a little, um, oh yeah, yeah, okay. So you have a TS in the first one and you have an S in the second one. So they say, well, maybe the S comes from an STS. And here's uh, the same in type B syllables. So we have a TSH and an S. So you think, ah, maybe it's a STS. Okay, and now um, those were all examples of S clusters that became S in Middle Chinese. So now we will look at S clusters that become uh, SR in Middle Chinese. And it, you know, it's basically uh, not going to shock you that they're the same kinds of situations where there's a medial R. So uh, in the most simple case, uh, <laughs> they think SR becomes SR, yeah? And here's uh, the, the, the evidence for it. We have a, a kind of R series uh, and then there's an S in it. So, uh, uh, or there's an SR in it. Uh, so maybe uh, take it back to SR. And um, I will just point out that um, they appear not to reconstruct any words with the type A S R, although they do reconstruct S voiceless R in type A. So that's just, um, I don't know. I just feel uh, it may seem kind of random for me to say, oh, look, here's a hole, here's a hole. But I think it's good to, to you know, draw attention to these things. Okay. So then uh, we also have sra become sra, like in this case where, you know, you have. I don't know, it's pretty clear, right? You have velar nasal series, uh, and then you have an SR in it, so you take it back to uh, S velar nasal R. They appear not to reconstruct any words uh, in type A with this cluster. Okay. Now, that was it for SR. Now we move on to SY uh, in Middle Chinese. So they propose uh, these changes in uh, type A syllables. So, st, st, sk, sk, they all become sh. Um, uh, but uh, the um, sk to sh change only occurred uh, before front vowels. And this is part of the, the, the so-called first palatalization, which was, which we came, which I hit on a little bit in the presentation about the six vowel theory. Uh, which is that uh, you got a uh, palatalization of velars before front vowels as one, you know, moment of palatalization before you get the overall palatalization of type B initials. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's what I just explained. Uh, so, uh, so the restriction is a result of the first uh, palatalization of Old Chinese. Uh, and... Um, Uh, yeah, so and, and and this is basically, you know, um, how you get the, the 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 relative chronology right. Yeah, so we imagine that you had something like ski. So let's say ki changes to chi. Well, so then you think ski probably changes to chi. Uh, and then chi changes to shi as as uh, an exact parallel of the change that we also ta saw of st changing to s, yeah. And I'll just actually, I don't know, I feel obliged to say, because I'm a tibetologist, these sound changes of uh, st to sh and uh, st to, uh, or st to s happened in Old Tibetan, like are, are like philologically attested to have happened in early Old Tibetan. So, so there are sound changes that feel, you know, very dear to my heart. Let's Okay. Now, uh, aspiration after initial S, uh, Shecheng series mix homoorganic initials of different manner of types. So it, it is not possible to distinguish uh, uh, aspirates on the base, you know, after, after like, it, let's put it this way, SP and SPH, 
you know, are neutralized in Middle Chinese because both of them turn into S, yeah, if you like, yeah. Uh, so, um, so Baxter and Cigar do reconstruct these differences, uh, but on the basis of aspiration in Min or other dialects. So that's so that's just basically an answer to if 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 you were wondering to yourself, how can you know whether these these things were were aspirated or not because it's neutralized in Middle Chinese uh, after an, a pre-initial S. That's the answer is, is you look at things other than Shesheng series. So here we have uh, ST goes to Sh. So you see, you know, a nice dental, uh, you know, dentals and palatals. Actually, this, this answers, this is an example. It came up very end of yesterday. Are there Shesheng series that mix uh, palatals and dentals? that argue for the sound change of dentals to palatals in type B. Well, here's an example. Uh, but it's also an example of um, uh, sh initial words uh, intruding into a dental uh, Shesheng series. So is evidence for uh, st goes to uh, sh change. And here's, uh, you know, I, I just, I've discussed, I presented these changes already. Now I'm giving you the evidence, right? That's what's happening here. So here's, uh, a, a velar uh, a series, and you notice one with high front vowel, uh, and uh, evidence uh, of, uh, of uh, for ska because there's a a sh that is intruding into it. Uh, yeah, and then uh, I um, will just mention that uh, Baxter and Cigar think that in type A syllables. Sk changes to k rather than to sh, uh, but they don't use Shesheng evidence for that, so I'm not going to mention it now. Um, and by implication, uh, they would say that sk develops into k also in type B syllables, you know, when not in front of high front vowels, uh, but they don't explicitly say that, as far as I can tell. Okay, so now with aspirated k. And uh, they propose the aspiration uh, because of aspirate uh, pronunciations, uh, such as actually including in Mandarin, in, in Guangzhou, uh, which point to a, a Middle Chinese reading uh, with, an, with an aspirate um, palatal. But the, but the actual Middle Chinese reading uh, is with an S, right? Yeah. OK. Now, tight pre-initials as an origin of Middle Chinese Z. And you'll remember uh, yesterday when I presented the, the simplex initials, I said we can get rid of the Z because it has so many origins. Well, now is where we're going to see those origins of Z. Uh, they all involve uh, pre-initial S. OK, so here we go. Before voiced uvular. So this is a. Uh, a, a uvular series. Why is it a uvular series? Just to kind of, you know, I don't know, repeat things so you get used to them. Well, because you see contact between ya initial and a velar. So it has to be a uvular series. And we reconstruct the ya to a, to a voiced uvular. And then we have a z that, you know, that intrudes in this uh, series that we think is a uvular. So why not reconstruct it as an s before a voiced uvular? And then you can understand the uh, the voicing assimilation as the reason that it changes into a Z. Uh, Baxter and Cigar also reconstruct SD and SMT as source, sources of, of Z, but not on the basis of Shesheng evidence. Okay. And then we also have, you know, uh, S, little gr changes to ZR uh, in this series. And uh, now, you know, we go from origins of Z to origins of Z. And they're very parallel to the origins of Z that we saw. So uh, here is a series that is clearly velar uh, because it, it mixes, uh, you know, Z in, in, in type B and D in type A. Uh, and then it has a Z initial. So let's, you know, let's uh, propose that it comes from SG. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, they believe that SG developed into G, uh, but uh, their evidence for this 
uh, does not come from Sheshon series. So again, very parallel to the SK situation, which is that this SG goes to Z would only have happened before high front vowels uh, in the, because of the first palatalization. Okay, and now uh, tight pre-initial S as one of the origins of Tsara. So Baxter and Cigar uh, maintained that a tight pre-initial S before QR gave rise to Tsara. And here's uh, evidence for that. So we have a glottal uh, initial, which might come from a uh, from a uvula, and we have contact with a tsra. So they they let's say this is the kind of problem uh, that motivates them um, reconstructing uh, uh, this sound change. And actually, maybe this is a good one in terms of, uh, you know, Schussler, I mean, I mean, I don't know about what Schussler would say about this particular case, but he would look at something like this and say like, like really, um, it, it maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe these aren't a Sheshang series, or maybe there's, you know, th this is the kind of place where I think he would be a little bit uh, suspicious in terms of, well, it's not prima facie totally obvious that, that a tsara would come from a skara. Uh, uh, but if you want to make uh, the Sheshang hypothesis work on this Sheshang series, well, Baxter and Cigar have managed to do that. Okay. Uh, and then uh, a similar one from type B. So you have Tsara uh, uh, connected to a glottal. Uh, so you know, there you go. Uh, and now the aspirate uh, equivalent. So this is um, pre initial S as one of the origins of tsa. So Baxter and Cigar take tsa as a reflex of a voiceless resonant prefixed with s if there is any evidence of connections to words that are otherwise known to have resonant initials, whether voiced or voiceless. So here's an example. S before voiceless n in type a syllables they think changes into tsa. And here's the reason why. It's uh, because of uh, these two words. Uh, and you see why I've given the, um, the um, pre-chin uh, orthographic forms, because the, the, the modern forms of the characters doesn't make it obvious that these are related. So the second one means person. And the first one means a thousand. I think if I if I'm wrong about that, uh, someone tell me. Um, uh, so you know they were written very very similar in in uh, right back to oracle bone inscriptions. So they think well they must have been similar then, right? And they don't cite uh, Shishang evidence for the same change in type B syllables, but they do reconstruct uh, the change in some words. So in particular this um, this word uh, twice. And I don't, they don't quite spell it out, but I think it's pretty clear that what they're thinking is that uh, the word twice is related to the word two. Yeah, so it's an etymological speculation. Uh, and, um, and that this sound change uh, would give you the machinery to link those two words. Yeah, okay. So now uh, before a voiceless resonant, you, uh, sorry, a voiceless lateral, so we have a nice lateral series, you know, connection between a da and a ya. And then uh, there's a tsa initial that intrudes. So why not uh, use, uh, you know, the machinery we've already developed to solve that problem? They appear not to reconstruct any words uh, in type A with this cluster. Uh, now the aspirate equivalent. Uh, so here uh, we have uh, uh, connection between uh, a tsa initial and a ta initial uh, with the with the cha, you know, is the usual dental palatalizing type B. So they say, okay, maybe uh, you know we've we've already seen this kind of uh, argument before. Uh, yeah, so so that's another sound change, uh, and then onto this one. Uh, uh, which I think I've mentioned already, that S, Q, H changes to S or T, depending on dialect. I include this here. It's not exactly Sheshang evidence, but it's pretty similar because it's two readings of the same character. 
right? So this character means slipper or shoe, and uh, it has two readings, one with a, 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 a sa initial and one with a, a tsa initial. So I would say, generally speaking, I don't think they articulate it as a principle, but it makes sense. When there are two readings of the same character in the same meaning, that's kind of a pretty good indication of, of uh, let's say, a dialect uh, split and then uh, borrowing uh, into the same, um, let's say, standard uh, that gets represented in the Guanyin. OK. Uh, so it's not clear to me on what grounds they uh, reconstruct a uvular in this word, kind of, uh, per se. Uh, so it, it, it uh, appears to be because uh, the, 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 because of this loan into Pro Mien, which has a velar fricative initial. Uh, yeah. So it, it, so I think the presumption is that this word shares the same root. Uh, yeah, I won't. I it's, I don't want to get sort of drawn into these details, but they're in the presentation if you want to look at them later. Um, but they do show kind of that um, the level of sophistication, I think, and I mean that in a good way, uh, in the 2014 book, which is you know you, you look at uh, this intricate interrelationship between uh, borrowings into unrelated languages uh, and um, Shesheng series and etymological speculation. So now just uh, um, sticking with, uh, well, yeah, I'll try to get, let's try to get through the, the S initials. So uh, they propose um, both sra and tsra as two sources of tsra in Middle Chinese. Here's uh, some Sheshang evidence, uh, a character that starts with sra having contact with a character that starts with tsra. Um, in type A syllables, uh, instead, as we saw earlier, um, they have tsa develop into tsa. And then here's the other source of tsa, uh, which you get from uh, this case of a character with two different readings. But I would say that I'm a little skeptical here because if the S prefix, which you see in the first of the two readings in their system, is morphological is a morphological aspect. One would expect it to somehow contribute to the meaning, and uh, and it doesn't. The two readings, you know, refer to the same meaning. Okay. Uh, oh yes. So we're almost done with the s's. So so we get s as a source of the. So 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 in the first of these bullet points, you see Sheshang evidence. So you see a contact between. Piang and uh, Zhang, Ziang. So they think, well, uh, you know, the, the the second character must somehow have a labial in it because uh, otherwise they wouldn't be in the same Shesheng series. So they reconstruct that back to uh, SB. Uh, and then uh, this is, you know, kind of uh, not technically a Shesheng series, but ex exactly that sort of rebus principle I was talking about, which is this one character. Uh, uh, in early uh, sources, it splits into two characters to distinguish two different meanings. It meant nose and self. So the reading meaning nose is with a B initial, and the reading meaning uh, self is with a Z initial. So it's, it's very similar, and they take it back to an SB cluster. So now that's basically it for uh, pre-initial S's based on you know, mostly Sheshang evidence. Uh, and I'll just sort of, uh, you know, wrap up that section. Uh, and I have a concern because um, I don't see much sort of elegance in this, uh, in these proposals. Yeah. So, so tsa tsa tsa, you might expect them to have similar sources in in uh, pre initial S, but they don't. Uh, and I mean, maybe this isn't a big consideration, but I think it points to the fact that what's missing from the 2014 book, which was in the, two, in the 1999, sorry, the 1992 book, is really ordered sound changes. Like, uh, we, let's move away, this is sort of, you know, I don't know, a proposal, if you like, as a discipline. We should move away from this sort of ad hoc, 
uh, proposing sound changes to, to fix particular Sheisheng series uh, and say, no, we need, we need to come up with a co coherent story of how did the one language develop into the other one through uh, ordered sound changes. And I don't see that that is very easy. And actually, you know, at one point, I sort of intended to do that in my book, and it, but it turned out to be, it would have delayed the book by, you know, uh, a few more years, so I decided not to. Uh, anyhow, so that's a, uh, that's one sort of reservation. And then also, uh, you know, I've been pointing out gaps. So let's look at the distribution of pre-initial S. Well, we don't have, you know, spa, spa, ska, ska, uh, but we do have zba and, and ska in type B syllables. So it just seems very like, uh, you know, weird distribution. Now, I think what Baxter and Cigar would say is, well, these clusters probably existed and we just haven't figured out what uh, evidence to look for to reconstruct them, or uh, they were lost without a trace. Things can be lost without a trace. But I think both of those stories of where they lost without a trace or what evidence should we be looking for to reconstruct them would be would sort of be natural consequences of, uh, of an ordered list of sound changes as part of our theory of old Chinese uh, reconstruction. Okay. Um, oh, and then, yeah, and then as mentioned, this is just just there's more um, kind of objections I have to the distribution of the S. So it's clear that much more work remains to be done on old Chinese phonotactics. I think that there are these things like also, you know, having a first person pronoun that starts with a velar nasal uh, happens in Sino-Tibetan and in um, in uh, um, uh, in uh, what language family is Kasi in um, in uh, uh, Austroasiatic uh, and yeah um, and and I don't know I I, I my, my inclination is to say these are these are sort of um, that there are materialist explanations for these things somehow in terms of uh, of of um, you know. Um, very, like, I don't know, in, in human biology and communication needs, yeah, uh, that are also things like, um, um, actually, one that I've been thinking a lot about recently is, is it a coincidence or is it a borrowing that, uh, that uh, Indo-European has a word, something like quen for dog, and that Old Chinese has a word, something like quen for dog, um, uh, uh, but actually, Baxter and Cigar reconstruct the, that not with an N, but with an R, so that you get something like Gor as, um, as dog. And then I sort of think, well, it could be a coincidence because, uh, because you know, having a word for dog like curl or, you know, grr <laughs> is, is not so surprising. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. Um, because the the use of a second character to represent loose pre initials is is not at all systematic in old, old uh, Chinese, and I would again uh, sort of compare to um, Sumerian, where Sumerian had uh, like actually it's a very interesting thing, which I think is 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 a very good uh, comparison. Maybe some of you know more more about Sumerian than I do, but the earliest stages of Sumerian have the worst evidence for prefixes. Uh, and then the, as the prefixes actually became unproductive or as no one knew Sumerian and had to learn it as a second language, the, the writing of the, the prefixes becomes more systematic. And I think that has a natural explanation, which is actually um, that when the prefixes were totally productive, you didn't have to write them. You know, you could just say, the kind of uh, overall syllables, and people would know the, the necessary grammatical interpretation and apply the necessary prefixes for that grammatical interpretation. But the 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 less you could rely on people to um, to actually productively use this morphology uh, or or to have command of it, the more you had to write it explicitly. And I think actually, in in a sense, the the problem for you know uh, old, old Chinese uh, is that we have no Akkadian you know there was no there was never a moment where a huge body of of foreign uh, speakers needed to learn old Chinese when it still had pre-initials and if 
that had been the case, I think we would have much stronger evidence. But I, I, I think kind of, I mean, you can almost think like uh, as a thought experiment, what would have happened if the Sumerians uh, lived until today? Well, they might well have an, uh, ended up with a, a kind of highly analytic, uh, you know, tonal language. <laughs> uh, and the philological evidence for the, those prefixes would be extremely scant because the occasion never would have arisen naturally to write them down. They would just, you know, uh, yeah. Anyhow, that's my sense, which is to say the preservation of those two character writings is really specific to the Shuji for the reasons that I, uh, I said. We will get to, is there Sheshang evidence for loose pre-initials? Uh, I think so, uh, but it's later in this presentation. This really doesn't bother me. I mean, maybe it's because I'm a Tibetologist, but uh, I think that having, you know, uh, you know, S P, uh, like, like I don't know, S M T R, uh, yeah, I, like having loads of initial clusters but only one glide, it doesn't bother me. I, I mean, uh, maybe it should. Oh uh, yeah, so 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 I have uh, self-consciously not said anything about uh, morphological structure, you know, because I think Sheshung series as evidence don't point to that. So I think that yeah, you can you can understand that that actually all pre-initials. That's what Baxter's sorry. That's what Cigar's 1999 theory was that all pre-initials are morphological affixes. All roots have a kind of C optional R vowel C, uh, but it's clear that in certain cases, actually, I would point to elbow as an example, which is now they reconstruct elbow as something like the crew. And I think there's very good reasons for uh, uh, reconstructing elbow that way, but they don't have any theory about the morphological function of the th. Yeah. So, so I think that, yeah, this is what, this is exactly the sort of thing I was explaining, which is that like, uh, the the current version of the pre-initial theory passed through a phase where where morphological structure of the root was the primary consideration, and and I think that was very helpful for them. But it's not clear how much they're sticking to that as an idea at the moment. Let's say this is actually gets to the the controversy about the the pre initial s that I that I referred to sort of at the beginning, where uh, uh, Meitu Lin in particular reconstructs an s where Baxter and Cigar reconstruct voiceless resonance. So um, Baxter and Cigar uh, sort of well, it's not worth rehearsing that whole discussion. But I would say the problem that Meitu Lin has is explaining the evidence that they explain with a uh, pre-initial S. I don't remember whether he has an alternative theory for that. Uh, but what your point is, is that like, you know, uh, there clearly are cases and we saw some with like person and thousand where there's variation in a Sheshun series or in a word family, so-called, uh, between re voiced residents and voiceless residents. So Baxter and Cigar recognize that problem and say, eh, someone else can deal with that later. M maybe, uh, probably, these voiceless uh, resonants uh, did start as some sort of constant cluster, but you know they think at the at the level of, of at the synchronic level they're interested in reconstructing. Uh, old Chinese had uh, you know let's say n voiceless n s n and s voiceless n. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you like at 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 you know at whatever moment old Chinese was, yeah, <laughs> uh, which is, let's say, uh, in, in, in their approach, as early as possible based on entirely Chinese data. And I think they're very good about that, much more so, I think kind of they go a little too far, uh, much more so than, let's say, Pang, Pang Wuyun or Zhang Zhang Shangfan. Baxter and Cigar really feel like you cannot use comparative data when you're working out old Chinese. Um, uh, comparative data to, say, Tibetan and Burmese. 